Hi there and welcome to a new episode of Afterthoughts. My name is Wim Winters and tonight I have recorded a next part of the Kramer Etudes. You know we have done I think four series of four etudes. This is the fifth one, four etudes again. And for those of you who haven't seen the previous videos, they will be linked up in this video as well. But uh, long story short, this is the edition made from Beethoven's score. Uh, Beethoven owned the score of Kramer Etudes. He used that for uh, his students and he made annotations. So he gave comments. Uh, with each of these etudes, not all of them, but they have been noted noted down by sorry, the comments have been noted down by by Schindler, and about twenty one of them, yes, twenty one, are signed by Beethoven. The other ones not, and are not included in this volume, which is a kind of pity, because uh, it might be interesting to look at those comments as well. I actually don't know where I could find them because I really would like to see them. So in generally speaking, and we have talked about that in the previous episodes, Beethoven emphasizes, and that is a pattern you see often in the 18th century in historical sources, the accentuation pattern and the connection with the verses, verses of poetry. So that's something, that's a connection that these days is not um, stressed upon enough. And also for me, it's, um, it's not new, but it's something that I don't apply in daily life as a musician, so to say. So accentuation is something we do very natural. And the clavichord, of course, is very uh, express, an expressive tool for that. But the combinations to the spoken word to the rhetoric of the spoken word is something that really is was very important one thing that i should mention is that the inequality like the french have actually beethoven is writing about that as well he's, he's, he's writing about long and short and it's not clear to me whether he means really physically lengthen the note like the french would do to play inegal so um, or that he is just emphasizing the long, the heavy beat and the, uh, the soft beat, strong beat. You should check it out. I, there might be a link on EMSLP. I don't know, but this is the universal edition. I link in the description. I don't know if it's available still, but it's very, very, very interesting to do. Let's start and dive into this music a little bit. Um, the first one is an A flat major. And Beethoven writes that one should look for the melody. And it's a kind of surprising, of surprising that it's kind of uh, strange that he says, well, you have to find, for instance, in the E flat, A flat, C, A flat, und so weiter. And that the melody is not always on the same space. So what he would mean is actually that you have a lot of contra accents. And I haven't played it that way because I don't really like it that way, but it would sound a little bit like this. So I just have uh, chosen for a more rhythmical approach and a little bit faster tempo. Maybe he played it a little slower. So with the emphasis on the, on the, on the accentuated uh, uh, beat. And you might notice that I don't play the piece legato. Legato is written in between brackets, so I don't know where it comes from, but legato would sound like this. Making it rather difficult to have um, that kind of joyful accentuational pattern that I would like to have. Um, and there you, you come on the edges of what Clevercott is capable of. If you were to like to play this legato, it's very difficult. Here. Like, like this, the A flat and the top, you really have to reposition your hand. 
and then go back. So it's a, it's it's a this is about a very fast repositioning if you want to play it on the clavichord. Of course, on the piano you can open your hand a little bit, and certainly on the tafel clavier, so the, the equivalent of this um, form, but on a piano form, it's very easy to play. I mean, the key, the tone projection is much easier than uh, than on the clavichord. So it's much easier than on the, on the, on the, on the, on the piano forte as well. So uh, on, on the clavichord, one has to be careful really for positioning of his hands. So I, I don't open my hand, but I go to the E-flat. So, and one would ask, well, how can you know when you have to release the note and go to the E-flat and the way you go to the E-flat? And because it's all happening so fast, and I would say, well, it's uh, your ears are, are giving directives, and it might sound sound stupid, but it is like that. Uh, the ears are a kind of pre-hearing, if that's correct English, the sound that you would like to hear, and as the hear hearing is directing your motoric action. Um, there is no other way to do this. Certainly, if go down was. <laughs> With, with the all the flats, so all the things that CPE Bach kind of prohibit to do here, you have to do because you have new so many new keys. Well, CPE Bach had 24 keys, obviously, but they didn't use it like here. And you can feel if I play it slower that you have more this Beethoven-like melody, and it's kind of beautiful. Also. I do think that many of that, much of that music is being played way too fast today. And even I do it, I mean, that's a really, and uh, actually a kind of too fast tempo, but I did like it. Okay, and then you have this, um, piece that makes me angry. This is the most difficult of all. And I have to say again that it I might play it a little bit too fast, but it, yeah, you know. I know octaves, you know. Oh, sevens. Seven. Seven. Octave. And here is a difficult one. It's going over the octave. So you have to jump. I, I'll be honest with you, I miss that jump often. Luckily you don't hear it. So what Beethoven writes here is actually very true. It's a technical remark that in order to be able to play that, you have to position your hand, hands very strong, very firm, and then go down and go up. So release. It's indicated like that with bows as well. And give attention to the left hand. able to play this piece by pre-reading we talked about pre-hearing but here I have to pre-read because if I don't read the notes really in advance I cannot know if I have to play a seventh or an octave octave seventh 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 octave seventh. so that's uh, and another thing is if I play this piece two times my hand stiffens really because it's need is you, you need to, to have a kind of you can't play this very relaxed because um, it's actually written by Beethoven we have to have uh, a very firm touch here a little bit with a stiff wrist not too much because you have to release a note but the positioning of the hand is only possible when you really also pre-form your hand, all these pre-edge uh, 
uh, the words. So the drum has the first finger has to be in position all the time, and when you play that till the end, it kind of stiffens your hand. And so if I play this two times, I really have to relax a little bit. So this is a very tricky piece, um, and one of the ones that you really think really can feel as an etude like. Then very beautiful contrast here with this. And the only thing that Beethoven writes is that you have to emphasize the third beat for the first beat. The trochaeus, trochaeus like in German. Beverly legato. Although the bass is impossible to play legato on the left. I cannot go from this B flat to this E flat legato playing the hands also legato. I would have to shift uh, fingers very shiftly, very very swiftly and that, that, that on the clavichord is not possible. Now, the fingering as indicated by Kramer is not indicated as, as well, so it's indicating a release of the bass. But, but by doing that, you get this feeling of 3 to 1 So it's actually very nice, and then come to the beautiful thriller. A very smoothly beginning. And I'm thinking on the end. It's only one moment that it's right. This is a very beautiful piece, but also a terrible piece for tuning, because you have this <coughs> All these octaves and this third and this uh, sixth is really going over the octave. So <laughs> it, it's difficult. Um, on the piano it might be easier, certainly on the modern or on the Irar piano, because you have not that many upper tones compared to a, an 18th century instrument. You see like this. That's a, that's a big third, that's a, that's a major third, over an octave. It's, it's difficult to tune. So you have to make compromises, but tuning is always a compromise. Even if you have an equal temperament, you have to choose sometimes. But beautiful beat, it's not, if, it's not too difficult to play and I can recommend that. And then you have the last one, I have to check again on my a tablet because Anya is not assisting me tonight. One of the kids is children is a little bit uh, ill. It's not too bad, but uh, she stays upstairs. So uh, we are on our own, so to say. Then the last one is number 41. And uh, it's, it's a really fun piece to play. Not too easy. You might have noticed as well here that I just disconnect the melody. Why am I doing that? Because the tension going to the E and then to, the, to this E and to the upper E would give an accent on the clavichord and chart. So I just release it, and that's something I always do. If I would, if I have to play a melody or kind of melodic line or just a figure of whatever a theme that uh, is complicated because I have to do another theme or another figure in the same hand and so you get a kind of situation where your hand where you have a kind of um, uh, stressed feeling just release the note and suggest the legato it's much more beautiful um, than uh, trying in a very um, um, crisp in a very uh, unnatural way to, to, to make the legato happening. And then you have in the left hand for the melody. If you really want to let it uh, come out, then you should just do a little 
cheat a little bit, play it a little bit too little. Certainly, the more narrow that the interval is, the more difficult it is to emphasize the upper notes. But it's beautiful that this bass line is just very relaxed and very long over this 60 notes. I don't play, play them too legato, it's not indicated legato, it's suggesting just a kind of um, je perle, like one would say that Chopin had. Beautiful. So it is 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 going down and then that's surprising, but it makes it makes a huge effect. So you have this photo. Very early romantic, I mean the big feeling. Beethoven. And then the minuendo. And then it's beautiful if you just in the left hand uh, emphasize much more this counter melody. Okay, and so on. So we're finished now in this Beethoven uh, manuscript, so to say. Not the manuscript, but Beethoven score. But Kramer has written tons, not tons, but I think about 80 or 90 um, etudes. This is just a small part of that. And I will go through the other ones. Um, there are some original prints on the Petrucci library. And of course, what's very famous is the Kramer. Now, Kramer Bülow. So Bülow, uh, von Bülow made an edition of the Kramer etudes. etudes. It's an interesting edition because it's completely annotated, giving the um, detailed insight of von Bülow, so, which is of course not Kramer's uh, uh, time, it's later. But that makes it interesting to see how uh, people have those days just uh, interpreted that music. So we might do some other grammar to this in the future. Anyway, um, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly hope you enjoyed the uh, performance of the grammar etudes and that you like the music. Um, next time we will have, um, this will go the, this is, we are 2nd of March. We are recording now actually already for the 1st of April. 2016 and next time we will have yes we will have a new sonata by Kostas Papazaferopoulos a very 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 beautiful one I, I'm really looking forward to share that with you so again thank you for watching and we see each other soon again bye